Salting, smoking, sugaring, pickling, curing, canning, all are techniques that showcase the art of preserving. Today I'll teach you how two simple ingredients, salt and fat, can transform the flavors and textures of just about anything. Starting with a French classic, we'll salt duck legs and slowly cook them in their rendered fat. We'll serve them as a rich addition to salad. Next, lemon and tomato confit, both of which make excellent condiments. And lastly, learn how to turn a salmon filet into the most impressive gravlox, essential to any Scandinavian smorgasbord. Today we're going to learn several techniques of food preservation. There are quite a few different methods for preserving. One of my favorite ways of preserving fish, like this gorgeous filet of uh, king salmon, is to cure it. Curing uses a combination of salt and sugar and flavorings to preserve the flavor, color, and freshness of the food. And this is going to turn out to be gravlox. It's a traditional Scandinavian dish, one of my favorite ways to eat salmon. And it's cured unsmoked, and the salmon itself develops a buttery texture and a very nice, fresh, full flavor. First, make a dry marinade uh, using coriander seeds, about two teaspoons, uh, two tablespoons of sugar, and that's for a three pound piece of fish. You can multiply uh, these ingredients if you have six pounds or eight pounds or uh, 12 pounds. A whole half a cup of coarse salt, and grind this all together in a mortar and pestle. Just break those coriander seeds up a little bit so that you release some of their flavor. And we're also gonna add some black pepper, a heaping teaspoon of black pepper, coarsely ground. And that's as easy as can be. Make sure the fish is impeccably fresh, no smell and uh, you're gonna spread this dry marinade right over the pink flesh of the salmon. So completely coat the flesh. Lay a piece of plastic wrap on the surface of the fish. Now I put something flat on top. This will be weighted down. After a few hours, you can put some weights on this dish like some big cans of tomatoes or a cast iron frying pan. Then cover the entire dish so that it is airtight. You don't want the fish to pick up any smells from the refrigerator and you certainly don't want the other things in your refrigerator to pick up any smell. Put this in the refrigerator for 24 hours, turning the salmon once or twice during that time. So you have to imagine that 24 hours has passed and we do have a swap out. Uh, remove the cans of tomatoes, uncover the salmon. This little rectangular dish has come in very handy, by the way. That's a good way to weight down. What you're trying to do is compact the salmon so that the texture becomes all uniform. So here we have the marinated salmon. You can see a lot of moisture has accumulated in the dish. And now what we want to do is scrape off all the excess spice. So there, that's the spicy side. And there might be some excess here too that can be scraped off. And we have a clean dish. Put the salmon back in the dish. Sprinkle the entire fish with approximately a quarter of a cup of olive oil. A little more won't hurt. And two nice helpings, let's say about two tablespoons of vodka. And two teaspoons of whole coriander seeds. So we're continuing with the coriander theme here. I like the flavor of coriander seeds and I'm not crushing them this time, just putting them on whole. 
it's already, it's looking different and it smells different. It smells really good. Uh, coarsely chop uh, one bunch of dill. And this is going to stay again in the refrigerator, covered and weighted down for another 24 hours. So here we have our 48 hour cured salmon. Scrape off the dill and the coriander seeds. Those little bones that are in the fish can be pulled out with pliers like this. You can see how flat the ends are of the, of the pliers, and that's for easy removal of those pin bones that are sometimes stuck in the sides of the salmon. Now I found there are many different ways to slice salmon like this. So what I do is I cut the fish into equal pieces. And say I'm going to use bread like this for an hors d'oeuvre, I will cut the salmon the same size as the bread. So I'll cut myself a piece like this. Mm, what a beautiful texture. You can see how silky it is, almost shiny, it's so beautiful, with all of those spices and olive oil and vodka. You can use a fish knife like this, or you can use a Japanese knife like this. Um, and what you want to do is slice across the grain this way, uh, cutting the salmon pretty much in a piece that will nicely fit your bread. Now, isn't that a pretty presentation? Now, this process of slicing is helped by the fact that you still have the skin on the other side. Um, and that skin, you just cut down to the skin. And so if you want, just put a little drizzle right on top of this beautiful dill sauce, on top and below. It's very pretty. And these little squeeze bottles are so handy. And a little sprig of dill on top of each one. And this is a very lovely hors d'oeuvre tray, and I think your friends and family will certainly appreciate the effort it took to create cured salmon, Gravlox style. Uh, it's healthy, it's delicious, it's pretty, and it's not very difficult to make. And now we're going to confit some duck legs and thighs. Confit is a French word which means to conserve or to preserve. And duck confit is a rich, silky, and indulgent dish. It's made by curing duck legs like this, beautiful duck legs from the Moulard duck, which is a cross between a female Peking duck and a male Muscovy duck. And uh, the legs are very meaty. They're not terribly fatty. Uh, and I am trimming any excess fat and skin um, off each of the legs. This fat that's in this bowl is from all of these legs. And this we can render very slowly uh, over a low flame uh, to melt it down because duck fat is just one of those things that everybody should have a container in your freezer for cooking potatoes or um, doing any number of um, elegant French dishes. And we're using uh, altogether four and a half pounds of uh, duck legs and thighs. We're going to do a dry uh, marinade again on this uh, meat. So we have juniper berries, one teaspoon of juniper berries, which we're going to crush, hopefully, in our mortar and pestle. Now, juniper berries come from the juniper tree. I'm going to, oh, they smell so good. They smell just like a juniper tree. Mm, kind of whiny and delicious. Um, three bay leaves broken up. Six cloves of garlic smashed. These are peeled and smashed garlic. And three tablespoons of salt. Sounds like a lot of salt, but again, remember we are curing. We're curing with salt, we're curing with thyme, uh, T-I-M-E, and, um, and in this case, also refrigeration. So there, nicely mashed up. It's still a very, very rough mix. 
sprinkle it over the legs and toss the legs around so that each one has some of this marinade sec, they call it, dry on each piece. So just rub it all in. So this gets covered and put into the refrigerator for 24 hours. You can also keep it into the, in the refrigerator for up to two days. Confit is one of the oldest cooking techniques and it's been used since ancient times to keep meat from spoiling. Cooks learned early on that if you store something under an airtight layer of fat, it lasts longer. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to first cook the duck that's been marinating here in this dry marinade, and then we are going to store it under a layer of pure duck fat. Now we did not have enough fat from just the legs and thighs, so we uh, supplemented with some additional fat that we bought, duck fat. And so we're going to melt this and we will keep this uh, at a consistent temperature at 200 degrees. Clean off all the salt and spices from the duck legs. And we're going to put this in the fat skin side down. And you see I am using a thermometer. It's a very good thing to make sure that the heat stays at approximately 200 degrees. Many recipes call for a combination of lard and other fat. But for duck, however, use duck fat exclusively as lard would add a hint of pork flavor. Seven cups was just enough of the duck fat to completely submerge the legs and thighs. I'm going to raise this temperature to 200 degrees and I'm going to cook until the fat is clear and a knife stuck into one of the legs slides out easily. Uh, about three hours. So I'm going to monitor it very, very carefully. Keep adjusting the heat to keep the temperature consistent. So it has been three hours and our duck breasts are submerged in a very pretty clear yellow fat and they have decreased in size quite substantially. The meat has contracted, actually shrunk in size, and the uh, fat has completely melted off. And you can see how much yellow fat, there's more fat now in this pot than there was when we started. So gently, gently remove the legs from the fat and place in one layer in a dish like this. It's very important to make this in one layer because we want to now submerge it again in the fat. You can ladle the hot fat into a strainer. This is to remove any of the little impurities, the little brown bits. So now pour the fat over all of the duck legs and then refrigerate until the fat is completely solidified. So now uh, we're going to dig one of these legs out of the fat. What I'm trying to do is just get one leg, scrape off the excess fat, peel it off, and put it in a cold skillet. This iron skillet is perfect. And reheat it slowly. You don't want to brown it. And this is on very low heat. Cover and let it warm and crisp a little bit. Um, and you'll spoon off the excess fat as it cooks. It's going to take about eight minutes. We have a salad of frise, um, of endive, uh, dried sour cherries, and a nice mustardy vinaigrette. You can toss your salad. Well, I hear the duck crackling. It should be very nicely brown and crispy, and it is. What a beautiful thing. Crispy moulard duck. Now you can serve it whole like that or slice it, but it looks so pretty. Um, and this is a main course, so I'm going to just put the duck leg right here and serve it. That is confit of duck. Yet another way to preserve something, this time duck. Not only can you confit duck, you can also confit many other things, including tomatoes. And slow roasting tomatoes in olive oil concentrates and sweetens their flavors. 
making even ordinary tomatoes rich and delicious. Uh, and so let's get started. Make a little X in the bottom of a nice ripe tomato. This is best done in tomato season, but out of season you can find uh, some nice hydroponic tomatoes or greenhouse tomatoes that look like this. Um, put in boiling water for 10 seconds and then immediately immerse the tomatoes in iced water. This will stop the cooking, keep the tomatoes um, nice and hard, um, but allow you to peel off the skin. And so just now peel the tomatoes and core them. See how easily the skins come off? Just simple, simple technique. This is the same technique you'd use if you were canning tomatoes. Um, and now to core, just take this, the point of your knife and just go around like this and pop that out. So now we have our baking dish, uh, a dish just large enough to hold the tomatoes and sprinkle the garlic, sliced garlic cloves, about four in the bottom of a dish and some basil. Place the tomatoes cut side down in the dish and add about a half a cup of olive oil. Season with some salt and just use a, a good coarse salt. And this is a really, really fine way to intensify the um, flavor of these tomatoes. So a half a cup. And now these will kind of collapse after 50 minutes and they will be lightly browned and very tender. I'll show you what they look like. So now let the tomatoes cool to room temperature before packing in a nice glass jar. And oh, does this smell good? It looks good. And the tomatoes will only get better as they sit in the flavored olive oil. Ball jars like this are very useful. These are the old fashioned canning jars uh, in which you pack vegetables, fruits, relishes, pickles, confits. And make sure you use all of this olive oil. There's lots and lots of air pockets. So the best thing to do with that is take a tiny little rubber scraper like this and run it down the side of the jar, making room for all the liquid to fill all those air spaces, those air pockets. Always when you're covering a jar, wipe the rim of the jar with a warm cloth cleaning it well. You can wipe the jar later on and put the seal cap on. Hold it with your finger in the middle like this and then tighten the ring. And then wipe your jar. Now tomato confit actually improves as it sits. Um, and after you're finished with the tomatoes, you can also use the flavorful oil in vinaigrettes or in sauces. When you're grilling, just spoon a little bit of that garlicky, basil-y, tomato-y oil uh, on your chicken or on your fish, and it too will um, greatly improve those flavors. So you can confit little cherry tomatoes. These are many different colors, as well as the large tomatoes. A very good way to use up some of those excess tomatoes from your garden or from the farmer's market. Now, remember, once cone feed like this and put in olive oil, you must refrigerate these. And they'll stay in your refrigerator for um, several weeks. But don't forget to use them. They're delicious. So it seems that preserved lemons are popping up on restaurant menus everywhere. Uh, in fact, even one of my recipes in this uh, cooking series uses preserved lemons in a pasta dish. 
Preserved lemons can be used as a seasoning to give dishes a boost of flavor, and I love to use them. Uh, I use them when I make couscous, when I make tagines, when I serve pasta with botarga, and they are very easy to make, and actually the ones that you make at home taste a lot better than the ones that you buy. And what you need, salt, coarse salt, kosher salt, lemons, nice bright-skinned lemons, and a sterilized preserving jar. Uh, and this is a canning jar. It's a quart with a wide mouth. I think the wide mouth really helps. And just process this in boiling water for approximately 10 minutes. So let that drain well and start preparing the lemons. Cut off the stem end like this. And then cut from the very bottom of the lemon down about three quarters of the way with a sharp knife and cut the lemon into quarters like that. Just like that. So it's four pieces, but they're still held together. This is the traditional Moroccan way of uh, preserving lemons. Um, and then put the lemons into the salt and really pack the lemon with as much salt as you can possibly force down in those cuts. Put a little bit of salt in the bottom of the jar and start putting these packed lemons. You see there's salt down in each of the cuts. Put the lemon right into the jar. And you may get um, four or five lemons in a jar. And you see the lemons are getting softer immediately. The salt reacts with the lemon flesh and the juice. It softens them, but it actually still keeps them um, a nice texture. So I'm just putting as much salt in this jar as I possibly can, and squashing those lemons down. And this will go right into the refrigerator. Again, remember to wipe the seal. The juices will exude from the lemons, and you'll have a lot of juice as well as um, salty juice as the lemon sits in the jar. So there, that goes right into the refrigerator. Now, if you're going to be using these lemons for cooking, once uh, they've stayed in the salt for up to a month, you take the lemon out, see a totally different texture. Scrape out the flesh. It's the peel that you're looking for. And you can blanch the peel in a little bit of hot water. Or if you're using it in a bestia, you can just use it like this. But it's a kind of almost translucent lemon peel and whatever size you want to cut it into. Generally, it's a small cube like this. Very pungent, very tasty preserved lemons. Preserved lemons will keep for a year or more in a dark cupboard. Uh, the ideal curing time is probably three months. However, in as little as one month, the salt will have pulled all the water out of the rind, transforming it into a flavorful ingredient an ingredient as flavorful and as versatile as vinegar, salt, or spice. While all or some of these preserving techniques might be new to you, I think you'll find that they are certainly worth trying. I hope you enjoyed today's lesson. See you next time on Martha's Cooking School.